Hello. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're going to talk about phishing for security, reeling in phishing attacks across a global organization. And if you're going to listen to me for the next 30, 40 minutes, you should probably know a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Yash. Um, I'm the CISO at Sandbird. I'm a Bay Area resident. Been living there for more than 10 years. Every, every year we talk about moving out. Hasn't happened yet. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, I've been at Sandbird about two years now. Before that, I was at Twilio, Box, and ISEC, uh, doing pretty much security stuff uh, all my career. Now, a couple of fun facts before we start. I am not creative, so all the slide designs are done by Microsoft's designer option. If you haven't tried it, you should. It does the work for you. And the title of the presentation was given to me by none other than Chad GPT. So, fun fact, and this is true. I did the abstract, uh, came up with a few titles on my own, and I submitted it to different CFPs. None of them got selected. And then I'm like, what the hell? Let me try something else. And then I went to ChatGPT and said, hey, give me a presentation title which is catchy and which will work for CFPs that talks about phishing. And this is what came in. And the first one I submitted to was here. So here we are. A couple of disclaimers. Um, we use Okta as our single sign-on, so I might use those terms interchangeably. And what I mean by that is if I say Okta, please take it as SSO. Whatever SSO you use will fits the bill. Similar with YubiKey, so I might say YubiKeys or fingerprints because that's what we primarily use. And that I'm gonna use as a term for anything that's like FIDO2-based authentication mechanisms. All right, uh, a little bit of background. Uh, Sendbird is a communications API company which provides feature-rich and scalable chat APIs to help customers connect their users. Uh, we are a pretty global company. Uh, we have offices in South Korea, US, uh, in San Mateo, California, UK, and Singapore. And we also have individuals spread out globally in smaller satellite uh, offices sort of things. Um, IT, security, GRC, physical security, and US and UK workplace also report into security. Uh, this will become relevant as some of this is used, sort of uh, push some of the initiatives we'll talk about in the future. Our tech stack from an IT corpsec perspective, uh, we're mostly a Mac shop, Jamf is our MDM, as, as I said, Okta is our single sign-on. All right, what's the motivation for this talk? Time and again, I've uh, done pen tests, I've hired uh, external agencies to do, come do pen tests on us, red teams, um, with zero knowledge, with some knowledge. Most of these, uh, the one attack scenario that has always worked is you send a phishing email, get an unsuspecting employee who's in a rush to click on it, that web page looks like a sign-on page that they've used. Maybe they're single sign-on, maybe something else that they're familiar with. They put in their creds. The attacker gets access to the user's account. Now, if you have MFA, you could do a proxy and then basically bypass that as well. And then you get into the internal apps, go to Confluence, GitHub, or Slack, get a bunch of tokens from there, maybe AWS, maybe something else that you're using, and that inevitably leads to your customer PII. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Yes, a lot of nods? Okay, good. Now, when I joined Sandbot a couple of years ago, I was thinking, can we make that a little bit difficult? We've done so many things, like that kill chain has been working for so long, can we make that a little more difficult to execute? And that's what this talk's gonna be about. It's gonna be about Sandbird's journey from having purchased Okta, and in about a year and a half or so, to about today where we have most of our applications behind SSO. Uh, we use device trust, we have FIDO2 MFAs only, and we also have rolled out passwordless for some of our applications. And I'll walk you through the steps we took, uh, what challenges we faced, uh, what were the outcomes, like what changes we made that were uh, easy to implement, hard to implement, all of that stuff. And all the changes I talk back to back, please bear in mind that happened over 
a year and a half. It wasn't like week one, week two, week three, right? Like we weren't making changes week after week or uh, sprint after sprint. This, these were spread out over a good 18, 19 months just to sort of ease things in, make people get used to it and all of that. Now, this one slide I debated whether I should put it or not, but I do want to talk about fishing, fishing simulations and trainings and are they important when you talk about combating fishing and all of that. What I believe is employees should be able to click on links. And you shouldn't be holding your employees responsible for falling for a phishing attack. Like phishing attacks are getting more sophisticated, m much more um, robust, and I don't think it's reasonable enough to hold individuals accountable to clicking on links. So I, do I believe in phishing training or phishing, phishing simulation? Yes, only to test your security controls, not to hold your um, employees accountable for phishing attacks that are happening on your organization. Okay, with that out of the way, let's do some quick definitions. Uh, these are things that you'll probably come across when you're looking into like FIDO, hardware-based MFA, all of that. You don't need to know all of these uh, in great detail um, for the sake of this presentation or even for uh, the whole implementation, but it's good to know. FIDO Alliance is a group of super, super smart people who made this all possible. WebAuth then is a browser standard, uh, WWW standard for passwordless authentication. CTAP 1 and 2 are specifications for how your browser or the operating system communicates with an external device. And FIDO2 essentially is an umbrella for including WebAuth and CTAP, all of those uh, on how you can do passwordless, modern, strong, uh, phishing resistant MFA using things like your Mac OS fingerprint, uh, Face ID, Windows Hello, YubiKeys, and so on. If that was too much information, um, there are great blocks out there. Go take a look. They'll explain how these work together. There are great diagrams of like how CTAB 1 and 2 work, how WebAuth then works. So, okay. Now, getting in, what's the first thing we did? Buying a single sign-on solution. Um, luckily for me, this was done by the IT team before I joined Sendbird, so I didn't have to convince our CFO that he needs to spend money on this. We already had this. Uh, this was easy to do for me. Well, what do you do once you have a single sign-on solution? So we got an Okta, and then the next phase of it was onboarding almost every application you have onto SSO. Uh, I started with everything that was in the IT stack because IT reported in to me. So we did like G Suite, Atlassian, Slack, all of those, and then the security stack came in next. Uh, EDR, our SIM solution, code security, and then eventually you start working towards like eng stack, GitHub, PagerDuty. This essentially becomes an ongoing process, as in when you find an app that's not behind single sign-on, you work with the app owner or the maintainer and your IT team, and then get them together in a room, spend 30, 45 minutes, get it behind your SSO solution. You can leverage partnerships. Uh, we have all, and a big thing that has worked for us is offering the app owner to like manage uh, onboarding and offboarding um, through SSO. And they're like, okay, fine, you're gonna take that part of workload off of me. I'm fine sitting with you for a little bit to put it behind Okta. What's our auth policy at this point? Um, employees are still getting used to using Okta or a single sign-on solution, so it's a pretty bare bones policy. Uh, Okta username, Okta password, any MFA, right? SMS, TOTP, push, YubiKey, like any SMS, uh, any MFA that Okta supports was enabled at this point. Uh, I'm going to keep populating this slide at different junctions just so that we can see uh, the progress being made. So as we start today, users can access any company application on any device using Okta credentials and any form of MFA. That's where we start. Okay, um, what's the first big change we made? We disabled SMS and email <coughs> multi-factor authentication. So at this point, you can still do TOTP uh, or push, 
uh, for your MFAs. Um, you could use Google Authenticator, Okta, Authy, like any of those. Those were still valid. We also started encouraging people to install the Okta Verify app on their mobile phones, and you'll see why in a later slide. Challenges uh, on this change, very few people complained. A lot of them were already using TOTP. Uh, SMS MFA wasn't that prevalently used, so this was a pretty minimal impact change for us. Now, big change too. Again, bear in mind, as I said, this wasn't back to back. We did the first change a little while later when things had settled down, moved on to the second change, right? So there's always some gap between every change you make. So big change too, we disabled TOTP and we also made people install the Okta application on their mobile phone. Uh, now push-based MFA is also susceptible to phishing, right? When the attacker sort of proxies everything, the end user will accept a push, but the attacker is being um, authenticated in. However, uh, one big difference here is when you do uh, push through Okta, your Okta logs will give you information about the device that's doing the push, where it's coming from, like a bunch of things that you don't get with TOTP-based MFA. So uh, we did that as our second big change. Challenges. So this was the first real big user experience change. Um, we had a lot of documentation. We have to help users switch to the Okta app. A lot of people had their personal TOTPs and personal MFAs and the work MFA in the Google Authenticator app. So they now had to be convinced to go install another app and move Sendbird's Okta MFA to the Okta Verify app. And again, we, all, we have a breadth of like technical, non-technical people. So this took a while. We had to work with people, make them do it, help them, documentation, all of that. One interesting question that came up was, hey, can I use multiple devices on which I install Okta Verify? I had people who had a couple of phones, an iPad, and we're like, okay, fine, you can do it. If we see an anomaly, again, our logs show it, and we will reach out to you. The only practical time when we reached out to an employee to see what was going on was when my incident response folks got an alert that somebody had five devices, five mobile devices registered to their Okta account. And we're like, what's up, what's going on? He's like, oh, uh, my phone didn't work, so I tried like phone, iPad, spouse's phone, and so on. So that's the only reason that happened. But again, going back to my point of with Okta Verify on your mobile devices, you see all of this that's going on. You see the device and all of that. Cool, so maturity roadmap, where are we? So your users can now access company applications on any device using Okta credentials and Okta push MFA. That's where we are. Big change number three, we rolled out device trust. So Okta is our single sign-on, Jamf is our MDM, Jamf and Okta have integrations where you could deploy a certificate to each of your laptop through your MDM, that's your Okta uh, issued certificate, and that can be used to identify which laptops or devices were issued by your company and which ones are not. And you could write policies that says, uh, allow access to these particular applications on company issued devices only. Uh, the IT team divided applications into categories, uh, two or three categories at that point, and one set of those was only accessible on Sendbird provisioned laptops. Think GitHub, AWS, CI/CD tools, anything that's critical that can potentially lead to customer information or any sensitive information. Those were only available on work laptops. Things like Gmail, Slack, PagerDuty, which had a legit need to go into or be used from your mobile phones, those were allowed on uh, mobile phones as well. Now, there is, Okta has this concept of registered and managed devices. So you could, in Okta, create a rule that says, allow mobile uh, access if Okta Verify is installed and registered on it. So it's not a, it's, when, when I say it's available on personal phones, you can just take any random phone and log into your Okta. You have to install a specific app, 
um, add it to your account, go to your Okta dashboard in your browser, do a bunch of things. So it's not easy to bypass those settings. Challenges. Um, this was one of the biggest changes we made. Uh, people all of a sudden could not do things from any random device. They couldn't just pick a device and get work done. Um, in South Korea, where we have a big presence, commutes are really long. People really like to get some work done on the train. So they weren't that happy that now they couldn't get work done while commuting on, their, uh, commuting on the subway. Uh, and I had a lot of, hey, I can't do X on my phone anymore. And I had a lot of conversations where I unpacked the statement of I cannot do X on my phone to, so you want to access your company code or critical infrastructure on your phone, which runs an operating system that might have CVEs on it, and the company's incident response team has no access to knowing what's going on. So once you start unpacking that statement of I cannot do X on my personal phone, uh, everybody starts seeing what you're trying to do and they realize the depth of the issue and they're fine with it. And at that point in time, there was a breach, I think that was Twilio, which was on which was based on phishing, and we leveraged that quite a bit to say, look, this is happening in the wild. Big reputable companies are falling for this. We have this opportunity to now uh, enforce things on our end so that we don't fall for this. And that honestly helped drive this. So a lot of communication, a lot of explaining why we were taking away something from them that they had. And honestly, at the bottom of it, it wasn't that people didn't want this change, it was just something they could do in the past, which they cannot do today. So anytime you make such a change, there's always resistance, so uh, patience and a lot of communication works. Another challenge here were shared accounts, like a lot of companies have like shared accounts, bot accounts that multiple people need access to. Now obviously you can't have a laptop for a bot account uh, and do device trust for it. So what we did was we have a VPN and we made a rule in Okta to say allow logins to these shared bot accounts from the VPN IPs. And we put VPN behind device trust to log in. So essentially, there was some level of device trust required to get into these uh, shared accounts, right? An employee had to log into the VPN, which basically means go through device trust and all of those things, then go into one password, get the password and TOTP for that bot account, and then log in to the shared account. So uh, quick clarification, we did make an exception that for uh, shared or bot accounts, TOTP was still valid. So that was an exception that we made in our Okta, but we put it behind device trust and uh, push on the VPN, so it basically covered that whole zone. Quickly looking into this, again, if I can make a statement, it would be employees can now log into critical company applications only on the company devices using Okta credentials and push-based MFA only. For things like email or Slack, they can access them on their mobile phones, which they have registered and set up with Okta. So that's where we have come to from, okay, we just bought Okta. Next big change, um, we enabled FIDO2 based MFA. So for us, these were primarily MacBook fingerprint or YubiKeys. Um, these weren't disabled before, these were always enabled, but we were officially talking about it, getting people to use it. So we were actively pushing for it. Uh, we distributed YubiKeys across uh, the company and I'll talk more into it. And we mostly bought YubiKey 5C Nanos, but essentially giving employees the freedom to choose any YubiKey that you want as long as it's, it's supporting um, FIDO2 and the protocols you need should be fine. Fingerprint versus YubiKeys. So the latest MacBooks or the Windows laptops, they do come with FIDO enabled um, authentication mechanisms on device. And a good example is MacBook fingerprints. Um, both of them give you the same level of security from like a hardware-based MFA. 
we did, however, distribute YubiKeys because one, now we have a backup, right? If a YubiKey fails and that particular engineer doesn't get another in the next couple of hours, like you're losing productivity. Uh, with this setup, you had both. And um, a lot of engineers have a multi-screen setup where they essentially close their laptop into a clamshell mode and don't really use their laptop but have everything on an external desk setup now. It would be a really bad experience if I say, cool, you got these nice 4K monitors and a big uh, mechanical keyboard. Every time you need to log into GitHub, open up your laptop, put your finger on the fingerprint reader, close it back up again. People would have hated me. So with these two in mind, we did um, distribute YubiKeys. What I've generally seen across the board is most engineers or most people who are technical in nature and have a multi-screen setup, they use YubiKeys. Others who don't need multi-screens, they just use their laptop or they're on the go, they're perfectly happy to use fingerprints. YubiKey adoption. So we didn't just give everybody YubiKeys. We initially started with engineering. Engineers are usually good at tinkering with stuff. They're, um, they love new stuff. So whenever you give them new technical things, they're cool with it. And let's be honest, they also, we also like to feel a little special as engineers when you get something that the rest of the company doesn't. So we gave engineers YubiKeys. Um, one thing we did was after seeing a lot of Slack messages with uh, YubiKey OTPs in them, uh, we started making a lot of documentation of like, hey, here's how you can disable long touch OTPs. Here's how you can disable passcode. We did disable passcode. That was um, a big discussion we had. So on a YubiKey, instead of just touch and do the MFA, you can set a passcode. So essentially touch, passcode, touch it again. It wasn't that great of a user experience. And we did a risk analysis of like, what are we protecting against by enabling a passcode on the YubiKey? And that was more physical theft uh, kind of things. And given our setup, we were okay with disabling it. So that's gonna be a risk decision for your company if you ever decide to do it, whether you do want passcodes on um, YubiKey or you just wanna get rid of them. Cool. Now, one interesting cha uh, challenge was distribution of YubiKeys. So we, we at SendBird have major hubs in US and South Korea. Uh, we targeted engineering all hand so that people are in the office. So to be clear, we don't have people coming into the office every day. So we had to reach out to them. And we're not big enough that we could use Yubico's sort of white glove service where they ship it to everybody and charge us for it. So it, we didn't want to do that. So we targeted uh, engineering all hands and like office days and both of these and we distributed the majority of YubiKeys on those two days and the rest of them we shipped them out and for individual folks who are like in Canada or India spread out without an office, we just figured out the best way for them to buy one and send them instructions on go here, buy this and then reimburse it. So we did that. And also, um, an interesting effect of giving YubiKeys to just engineering was it also acted as bait for us. There was these folks who were like, oh, engineering gets YubiKeys. Hey, can I get one? I want to have that. But like, If people asked, we gave it out. We didn't mandate non-engineers to use it, but if somebody came to us and said, can I get a YubiKey? Hell, give them two. I don't care. Uh, and there are also people who are like, hey, I have a personal YubiKey. Can I plug it in and use it? I'm like, Go for it if you want to use it. If anybody wanted to use a YubiKey, we would give it. And this was also part of the strategy of you give it to some people, let everybody else see it. They either come to you for more or they're like, they wait to get it, right? So that helped. We had a few challenges with distributing YubiKeys in US and South Korea. So bear in mind, this was about a year ago. Uh, things might have changed, but at that point, Yubico did not have a distribution uh, strategy or center in South Korea, so we couldn't buy from them, and Amazon isn't that big there. So we were looking around, we had a few ideas. Um, we had a, some of them was like finding a uh, reseller there or people travel from uh, the US office to Korea, so just giving them 
packs of UB keys as they travel. We debated and then eventually the IT folks found a, um, a reseller in South Korea, so we went that way. If that didn't happen, I would have just given one of our folks flying out a, a pack of UB keys to take with them on the flight. That was our backup. In US, uh, we reached out saying, hey, we need 5C nanos to UB kin. They're like, hey, we're running out, we're running low, this is gonna take a little while, but guess who had them in stock? Amazon. Um, another thing that I'll mention again, but it's, it's a cool thing that our uh, workplace team did here is, um, YubiKeys is always like a front-loaded cost to the company because you have to buy like $70 each for how many ever employees you have or whoever you're giving to. Um, he came up to me and said, hey, I was talking to finance. You know, we have all these corporate credit cards. They come with points. Guess where you could use these points on? Amazon. So we ended up using our corporate credit card points to buy YubiKeys for the company. Next big change. Um, we now mandated FIDO2 based MFAs for critical engineering applications like GitHub, AWS. We said, look, you've, we've given you YubiKeys, we've worked with you, set it up. Now, this is the only way you can MFA into some of the applications. This was a slow change, right? We gave them YubiKeys, spent time with them, gave them some time to set it up. So. Um, this was pretty smooth. Most of engineering were pretty used to it. Um, nothing major that was a blocker for us here. And then following along those, we then distributed YubiKeys to the rest of the company. Now, these two phases were drastically different because phase one is like, hey, engineers, here's a new thing to use. Relatively simple. But now you're going to all these non-technical folks with a new piece of tech equipment that you want them to learn and to use. So this took us a little while. Uh, we had to almost make it fun for non-tech people to start using the like making almost gamifying it a little bit, right? Like get them to use it, who can set it up faster than the other, that type of stuff. Eventually everybody's on board. Now this is not a challenge that I ever thought we would have. Uh, for context, all of our, most of our engineers have MacBook Pros and Pro Maxes, so they come with a lot of ports. But guess what? Everybody else has a MacBook Air. And here, I have a MacBook Air with me here. So it comes with two ports. And at home, I have a setup which has like a dock, so I just need one port to get everything working but people then, so one for their monitor, one for a charger, and they're like, hey, where do I plug this thing in now? I don't, I don't have space for it. So we had to then give out like dongles and whatever they wanted to make this work for them. And this was honestly hilarious. Now, we distributed YubiKeys to everybody. We got them used to it. Uh, we gave them dongles for people who wanted it. What do we change next? We disabled all other type of MFAs except FIDO2, which is YubiKeys or fingerprint or Windows Hello, anything that's FIDO2 compliant for all applications. Uh, simultaneously, we made it a part of our onboarding process. So when IT onboarded a new employee, along with the laptop, T-shirt, they would also get a YubiKey, instructions uh, and help on how to set it up. So everybody had a YubiKey, everybody was using YubiKeys. Um, and we also had spare YubiKeys in pretty much every office. So if somebody broke one or somebody was new or lost one, we just gave them another. The only minor challenge was when folks went on extended leave uh, and they didn't get a YubiKey, think maternity, paternity leaves, and they come back after a few months. Uh, they were locked out, and we had to just give them a YubiKey, get them set up, help them with it, and do that process a couple of times, which wasn't a big deal, but I'll just call it out. Now, if I rephrase where we are, employees can access company applications on company-issued laptops with Okta credentials and FIDO2-based MFA. For things like email and Slack, they can access them on their mobile devices, which they've installed and set up Okta Verify on. Next change, um, device policies. So all through the last seven changes, you have Okta Verify on your laptop, you have Okta Verify on your mobile phones. So 
you now has this, have this broad visibility into all the different type of devices that are accessing Okta. If you have an MDM, you s get that information too, but in Okta, you could write policies. You could say uh, minimum iOS version, minimum patch version, minimum Windows version, um, secure enclave, encryption, fingerprint enabled, anything and everything you could write. So we basically crafted policies that we were comfortable with, pretty low bar to get people accustomed to it and said, this is what you need, these are the criteria that your device needs to meet in order to access uh, company applications. We had a handful of people who had old, very old phones and they weren't able to access them. So we took those on a case by case basis and it was a risk decision for the company of do we want to allow them to do it or not? Now, Sendbird pays part of our mobile cell phone bill. So that was easy for us saying, okay, those folks were like, yeah, we get what you're trying to do. It's time for me to buy a new phone anyway. This is just pushing me over the edge to get a new phone. So it wasn't that big of a problem. Now, looking at this again, on top of everything we spoke about, now you have device policies as well. So you have SSO, uh, YubiKeys, device trust, and device policies. The next change we did was, let's try to get rid of passwords. How many of you hate typing passwords on your phone when you're trying to access apps? Me too. I hate it. People hate it. Um, does it add security? That's debatable, and I don't want to get into that in this talk. So. Okta has this concept of Okta FastPass. Uh, it's basically based on Okta Verify again and device logic that it implements. Uh, we enabled it for non-critical applications. And the reason we did that is because given the different countries that we operate in and the different uh, privacy laws of different countries we need to abide by, some of them mandate passwords and password rotation every X days uh, for employees with access to sensitive data. So anything that has the ability to get to customer data uh, needs a password to get in, but anything else, it's basically device trust, fingerprint, and like click-throughs essentially if you're on the right device. If I do this again, uh, employees can access critical company applications on only company devices which conform to a certain set of standards using Okta and FIDO2 MFA for things like email and Slack. You can access them on mobile phones and you don't need a password for a set of applications on both laptops and phones. That's come a long way. Now, let's talk about internally, internally built applications. How many of your companies have internally built God mode applications where you could go change any customer's settings and stuff like that? No one? Yes? Come on, don't be shy. Yes. Everybody does. Let's face it, every company I've been does it, everyone I've spoken to has it. This took us a while to implement and this takes a lot of goodwill and sort of trust within the company where you go to engineering and say, hey, the application you built, I need you to build Okta um, authentication support for it. and. They did, so most of our internally, all of our internally built applications now are behind Okta. To, um, before they built it, like in that delta of time where we asked them to build and we were in this place, but they're still working on it. Uh, we put them behind VPN, again, the same logic for shared accounts where they're behind a VPN. VPN needs device trust, YubiKeys, device policies, all of that to get in. And then it was usually Google Auth at that point. Uh, but today, everything's behind Okta. And I was waiting for this to happen before I actually gave this talk because I didn't want to come on stage and say, oh, we have internally built applications that aren't behind Okta. Our current, this is a sort of what we have currently implemented. Uh, critical apps, you have password, managed and registered device, which is biometrics and Okta Verify, FIDO-based MFA, non-critical apps, registered device, biometrics, no password on mobile or laptops. And using Okta Verify, we also have device policies that is minimum operating system versions, jailbreak detections, 
again, jailbreak detection is a cat and mouse game, so I wouldn't trust it completely, but for the normal user, having that said uh, would be fine. Where does this get us? And one fine morning, I see dislike message. I'll read it out. Um, this is one of our uh, engineers who said, hey, I wanted to share this with you guys. How is it possible that I can now access a lot of things within SendBird with just a password from my laptop, and even though there are multiple steps, they're all like button clicks and like click-throughs and fingerprints, and I don't really have to do much. So this, I take as a big win. We did a few other improvements. So whatever SSO provider you're using will have a lot of settings. I would encourage you to go look at them. We disable tar exit nodes. We also block geolocations that you don't have people working in. Now, I get you can anonymize your IPs and all of it, but again, like small increments make phishing and attacking your enterprise a lot harder, right? Like you have all these geopolitical situations where a country might not give you specific details about an IP that's abusing you, but another country might. So if you start disabling IPs of locations where you don't work in or you don't have relations with, like that delta goes down and down, and it just makes things a little more secure. Okta is also settings like impossible speed and travel controls, we enable that. Threat Insights is an interesting feature where Okta says, reading the documentation, that they look at threat feeds and like activity going on across the board of all of their customers and look for malicious IPs and use that data to protect all of their customers. They have it in like log or block mode. We, I, we have it enabled in, our, in a blocking mode. So if they see an IP that is a known bad uh, IP which has attacked some of their previous customers, if they see that IP trying to log into my Okta instance, it's gonna stop it by default. So I would definitely encourage you all to like take a peek at your SSO feature releases. They keep releasing awesome features time and again. I have clicked on these and those have broken stuff. So my recommendation to you would be to go to your IT folks and say, please turn this on. They test it the appropriate way and then turn it on. I have broken a bunch of things and my IT team's really nice about it, but I wouldn't recommend doing that. Cool, so here we are with the maturity journey. Um, at this point, if you remember the first slide of phishing somebody, getting their user credentials, proxying the MFA and getting access to applications, that's really, really hard. Even if you get my password, I don't get a push notification, I don't accept anything. So you don't get that MFA. On top of it, you're not on a company provisioned laptop, so you don't get access to it. And YubiKeys will verify a, a lot of things for you, like domain certificate, they have a bunch of checks that they do, so all the things that you would expect like an employee to do. Is it OKTA Okta, or is it like zero KTA, like all those things that you want individuals to do, like YubiKeys and, um, WebAuth and like that technology will do it for you inherently. So even if you press your YubiKey on a phishing page that looks like Okta, YubiKey is going to be like, nope, that, that's not what it is. I'm not going to uh, let this through, right? So you have those protections. Edge cases. Um, minor edge cases, uh, these were mostly like funny edge cases than uh, anything serious. Uh, once you turn on an auth policy, folks who have already logged in, let's say, to an application on a mobile phone and your policy restricts that particular application usage on the mobile phone, they're not going to get kicked out immediately unless you go do it. So I had complaints of like, hey, person X can log in to this application on his phone, why can't I? I'm like, bad luck. He He's grandfathered into this plan, you're not. You get the new price. And then Okta Verify, you need to make sure that it's on the start on boot list of applications because you need it to be running when you do your OctaFlow. A uh, couple of tips and things that we have seen in the past uh, that were either strange to us or we had to modify our behavior and, uh, and things that you don't, mistakes that you don't need to make because we have made it. One, document as much as you can. 
test it on your teams first, get their feedback, improve your documentation, and then um, release it to the rest of the company. One thing that worked for us is during the YubiKey adoption, I got my e staff, like our CEO, CTO, and CFO, I think at that point, um, to start using YubiKeys, and people started noticing this. Hey, what's that on your laptop, like sticking out? And then people started talking about it. And then when we said, hey, you get one too, and people were a little more receptive to it. Be patient. Uh, give people time to adopt. As I said before, not everybody is tech savvy. YubiKeys are something that they might not have used before. Be very patient, give people time to adopt, communicate as much as you can, document, and just be kind about it. Make YubiKeys part of your onboarding, uh, have them in all of your offices, um, and make sure to get them uh, well before you need them because sometimes they might be out of stock. And again, make exceptions when you need to. I was a little anal about making exceptions, but then quickly learned, take the 80-20 route, make it work for 80%. If somebody needs an exception to get their work done, it's okay. Octa log, so having Octa verify on your application that gives you a lot of logs, a lot of heuristics on what's going on, what people are using, what's the landscape of devices accessing your um, applications. Now, this is the biggest tip that I have, and this is the biggest mistake I made. We made a change during, I think it was end of month, and some of the salespeople were locked out of their devices just when they were trying to push a couple of the sales through. Uh, a week later, a senior sales uh, leader came to me and said, look, I get the changes you're making. I'm totally fine with it. Please never make them either during like end of quarter, end of month, and then we decided we're never gonna make these changes either in those like sales cycle um, hot periods or board meetings or company conferences or like any of those changes. Perfect, um, that was it. Uh, thank you all for listening. I'd be happy to answer questions. Yes. Like Octa Verify for device and YubiKeys, yes. Yes. So we had Octa Verify could do like the device trust uh, password list, and then you could say do that plus YubiKeys, so it could do both. Yes? Why did you do impossible travel so late in the cycle? We didn't do, it wasn't that late in the cycle, it was just in that slide, we had it enabled, but I didn't want to start with that because it wasn't significant enough to call out and start talking uh, in the first couple of slides. So timing wise, it wasn't uh, in the slides. We had it, we had a few settings done before and then that was probably on. A couple of the others were turned on late. Anyone else? Cool, thank you very much.